good stuff. And, it, and if I'm not sleeping now, I'll definitely be sleeping by then. Hand. <laughs> hand. <laughs> hand. Ow. Oh, wait. Don't forget to register for this Thursday's LAN party powered by NVIDIA. NVIDIA. This week we are playing Unreal Tournament 2003. We yes. played the full version last week. Yes. But we wanted to give everybody a chance to play again this week. We're switching back to the demo version. The full version will not work with these servers we're setting up. So download the demo version install it and load the latest patches to come play with us. Go to our website, thescreensavers.com, and click on Join Our LAN Party to register and for links to download the game. And if you do that today, we might see it this Thursday, November 14th, at our LAN Party. Truth is, the, the demo's free, so there's no reason not to have yeah. it. In fact, well, in case you, your system might be overwhelmed yeah, it's by a large it. Demo. Hey, got the news. <laughs> you, you upgraded from dual 800 P3s to, to a 2.4 gigahertz processor and an eight and a, a TI tw a 4200 just to play Sport, Unreal. just to play that game Unreal just to play that game and it was worth it it was worth it it's there a great game it. I love it Supreme News. Court says they're going to take on the issue of library filters three laws have passed since 1996 but the Supreme Court struck down the first and blocked the second now they've got to decide if the Children's Internet Protection Act Chippa 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 or Chippa Chippa they call it chip up. We have another four-letter word for it with the library. Flying down on <laughs> Filters have long been controversial with critics <laughs> saying they overblock, often blocking legitimate sites about health, politics, and science. And Proponents say that kids need to be protected from pornography when using computers in libraries. Mm -hmm. Isn't it funny that Clarence Thomas is going to be ruling on this? No comment. This decision should be out by June or July of 2003. Do you, do you let your kids go to the library without supervision? No, of course not. But they're at 10 and 8. We're right. talking 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds. That's where, you know, when you're in that gray area. A 16-year-old, you know, you can't stop what they're going right. to do. A 10-year-old, you could totally control them. Right. It's that middle ground where you don't have that much control. So you're saying you'll be able to block the curiosity of your kids when they hit that 10 to 12 range? No, that's what I'm saying. That's where yeah. you need help, and I understand. I'm sympathetic. My kids are at the, uh, still at the age where I can keep them from doing what I don't right. want them to do. That'll be, what, another six months? It's not much longer, I know. <laughs> this is actually a big story uh, for people who've been following this uh, as you know, right now, in many cases, when you buy mm -hmm. stuff on the Internet, there is no sales tax imposed on you. You only have to pay sales tax if the company you're buying from does business in the state you're living in, and the state you're living in has a sales tax. Right. Is it getting complicated? It's even more complicated because a lot of brick-and-mortar stores where you have to pay sales tax, mm -hmm. you go to a bookstore, you have to pay sales tax, are saying, that's not fair because these brick, these click-and-mortar stores, the, the ones online, right. aren't charging sales tax. They have an unfair competitive advantage. Congress has been saying all along, yeah, but it's a nascent industry. We want to give them a fair start. We're going to give them a moratorium on sales taxes. And besides, and this is the sticking point, Congress says, it's just too darn complicated to enforce because yeah. every state has different laws. And even within a state like and California, there are five different rates. Yeah, or do you count the state, the business, like, you know, is it the state Amazon is incorporated in, right. that their servers are housed in, that their fulfillment center is in? So 31 states have gotten tax? together because they're losing revenue. They're hearing it from the brick and mortars. Right. 31 states got together, and they have agreed. They passed just minutes ago a proposal for a unified sales tax that will make it possible to enforce a national Internet sales tax, a unified tax scheme. Modeled after the value-added tax. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. In many countries, they do that, Britain and so forth, where they have a na basically a national sales tax. Right. Nobody's proposing, or I shouldn't say nobody, but most people don't want a national sales tax. We can only hope. That would be a... I think a bad thing, but uh, this at least would get us a little step closer towards internet taxation. I don't know how you feel about that. That's, uh, that's a, you know that's a political one. Ooh. I have to say it's just not. I think it's not a fair playing field. I I love not paying sales tax, and I will look for right. a store online where I don't have to pay sales tax because we live in a high sales tax state that yeah. saves me seven and a half percent. I do that, yeah. but I don't think it's fair to the the people who do business in this state. They're losing business because I'm shopping online. Well, are you shopping online because you're losing business or because you can buy it online for 20 or 30 percent less without even thinking well, about the sales that, tax? Th then, it, then that will then why that will am be. I, why easy. am I going to spend 250 dollars for a graphics card? And down that the will level the playing field. Buy it for and, and then that's online. okay. That will level the playing field. Not, you're yeah. Exactly right. Anyway, that's uh, so that happened today. So that gets us one step closer to a unified I'm internet sales tax. I'm just tired of paying tax. taxes everywhere. <laughs> yeah, you and me both, but you know somebody's got to pave the roads and pay for the you know the air force and stuff. We got you know it's, okay. It's our civic duty. Our civic duty. No to one pay likes taxes. to pay taxes, but you got to do it. Question of the day. MSNBC reports a familiar story of Laura, a woman who posted her photograph oh. on an online personal ad, only so to sad. find it turning up on porn sites in an offensive spam. 
soliciting naughtiness. So they Laura, cut and paste her ad from the right. dating site and used it for porn sites. So the question is, could Laura have avoided this by not posting her picture online, or is this, you know, is all our information vulnerable no matter how careful we are? Our online poll question for you today, has your personal info ever been hijacked online? Mine has. Mine has. So has yours? Mine. Yep. Yes or no, you got 24 hours to vote. Go to thescreensavers.com. Let us know what you think. It says so here, this scary. is interesting, according to Jupiter Research, 34 million people have at least taken a peek at the internet dating scene. Have considered wow. online dating. 34 million people. Marty is 7 million of those people. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <He's fast. laughs> Marty still can't get a date. Man on the Tech TV, Aww. Net Cam. No, we're just kidding. On the Net Cam Network. Look at how cute he is. Johnstown, Pennsylvania. What's he eating? What is that? Rice. And, and peas. <laughs> that's so sad. How are you doing tonight, Matt? Yeah, pretty good. Where are you calling in from? Johnstown, Pennsylvania. All right. That's where the flood was. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Poor guy. A <laughs> hundred years ago, there was a flood in Johnstown, and nobody could forget it. What can <laughs> we do for you? What can we do for you, Matt? Well, I was going to be doing some uh, video editing for uh, TitanGamingArena.com's uh, Xbox LAN party here in Pennsylvania. Oh, that's and cool. Uh, do you work for that site, or? Yeah, yeah, basically. So what, can, what is it? Give me the URL now. It's uh, Titan-Gaming-Arenas.com. So is it like a commercial? Well, it, we're just getting it started up right now, and uh, 30th will be, uh, uh, November 30th will be our first event, basically. Titan-Gaming-Arena is plural? Yes. Okay. Com. I spelled it wrong, so let me do it again. So what, what can we do for you? Well, I was going to be uh, making a highlight video for it, and I just wanted to uh, see what uh, editing software you would suggest and what DVD burner you would go with. Ah, very exciting. You're using PC or Mac? Uh, PC. What was the name of that great program? And I've said this now twice on the show, and I never can remember, but you're very good at this. Pinnacle that Pinnacle DVD? Systems showed us. We love the Pinnacle Studio DV. So that's a, gr that's a great product. I mean, the, it is just a wonderful product. It's, it's inexpensive. If you don't have a Firewire card, you can get a bundle with the hardware and the software. Just a really, I think version 8 now, really excellent program. So I'd highly recommend that. Sonic makes a program called My DVD. We showed it here when they first were developing it. Also, very easy to use, really nice authoring package. It just kind of depends, Matt, on how much flexibility you want. On the one hand, there's packages like Apple's iDVD, which do it all for you. Don't give you a lot of flexibility, but make it very easy, you know, just kind of point and click. On the other hand, Matt, if you want more creative control, you're willing to spend the extra time, you want a more powerful package, th then you're going to have to look for something that has more flexibility, but is a little harder to learn. So you kind of have to decide which end of that scale you want to be on. Uh, but but I, I would say Pinnacle's Studio DV is really probably the best one out there uh, for authoring. As far as what to get, right now, of course, the Pioneer AO4 is the standard. It's down to 270 bucks, inexpensive. It makes DVD-R, uh, and I think DVD-R, and I think it's very good. Sony, in about a week, is coming out with this new 500 UL, the DRU 500 uh, drive, that will be DVD-RW, DVD, this is what we were talking about last mm -hmm. night, DVD plus RW. It also burns a little faster. It burns twice as fast than the DVD-R. So if speed is of the essence and compatibility, the ability to do all those different styles is important, you could spend yeah. a little, about 100 bucks more for the uh, Sony drive, which will be out next week. Henrik, is that the one we saw? Expression. That sounds this right. is an inexpensive, this is the, on that other side of the scale where you don't, you have less control over it, but it's much right. easier to use. And then Studio DV is the high end if you want something that's a little bit more powerful. PinnacleSys.com. And if you shop around carefully, you can probably find a DVD drive that's bundled with one of the editing software. So oh, at least you can try point. it out for free. It's a good thing to do. Shop around, Matt, and see if you can find something that's bundled. I, of course, the Sony comes with Sonic's My DVD. It comes with a bunch of software. That's one so way to check it in out. In fact, it has a very nice software bundle, I thought. Yeah. Coming but up? $389, $400. Bucks. A little more expensive. Hey, hey. It's a lot of money. That's, you know, it used to be twice that. True. Yes. It used to be ten times that. That's true. Coming up a little later on, Megan sounds like my weight gain. Shows you a fast way to find it used to be ten times more. The news on your iMac, a really cool product we found that's absolutely free. And after the break, is technology making the world's masses more intelligent? Or more scary? Both. <laughs> Smart mobs. We'll find out how they're forming with Howard Rheingold after the break. Our first guest is the founder of Electric Minds, an online uh, community, former executive editor of Hot Wired magazine, author of many books, including the brand new one. It's called Smart Mobs, The Next Social Revolution. Here's, there it is. Steve, you can give it to me now because I want my copy. This is good. 
how, do, how technology is making us smarter, but not necessarily better. Howard Rheingold, welcome to the show. It's good to have you. My pleasure. He is uh, turned from a shoe painter to a shoe painter proselytizer. He's spreading the word on painting your shoes. Love the uh, painted sabot today we have. Those are very, you're famous for that, aren't you now? I'm spreading the word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, you use the internet to spread the word. Yes. Do you expect that there will be a smart mob of shoe painters? The, I'm, I'm hoping to see on the streets of major cities around <laughs> the world people painting their shoes. Yes. <laughs> this would be an okay smart mob. Yes, a good that's right, smart a fun mob. one. What is a smart? I know what a mob is. It's a group of people who kind of lose their head and become a social animal and uh, and have you know often no conscience and just kind of go crazy. I've been part of a mob back in the '60s, and it's a weird feeling. What's a smart mob? Groups of people who coordinate their activities in the real world using mobile communications and the internet. So they're not necessarily all in one place, they, but they are connected. The, in one place. We have teenagers who flock, and we've got oh. a million Filipino citizens who demonstrate and bring down an entire government. And that's just the beginning. Yeah, it's amazing. SMS, this text, cell phone text messaging, was transformed the Philippine Revolution. Yes. They were communicating via cell phone, by yes, text. Ma manifestos, millions of messages, 100 billion text messages sent every month worldwide. You know, that hasn't taken off really here in the States for some reason, uh, probably a technical reasons. Um, what is it about it that makes it so big? It's huge in Europe now, in England, Finland? Asia? It's like instant messaging. There are a lot of instances in which saying, I'll be home in 20 minutes or I'll meet you at 5th and Main, it's a lot easier to send a message in text to somebody's screen than to call them on the phone. Also, there are a lot of opportunities to communicate where you, you don't necessarily have to be heard that, that are appealing to a lot of people in a lot of situations. Can you use SMS to do, to do from one to many, or is it always one to one? Yes, that's, that's what was big in the Philippines. You send one message, and then someone can forward it to everyone in their address book. Ah, so it becomes then a broadcast medium as well. Yes, that's, one, that's one of the things that's, that you talk about in the book, is it, it, for the last 50 years, broadcasters had kind of this dominant paradigm where it was us talking to the many, one to the many. And the internet's really changed that. It's many to many communications. Well, every desktop is now, for better and worse, a yeah. printing press and a broadcasting station and a place of assembly and a marketplace. Pretty soon, we're going to see everybody's pocket become all of those That's things. Amazing. That's amazing. When did you first start thinking about this? When I saw people on the streets of Tokyo and Helsinki looking at their phones instead of listening to them, I started looking into They're it. They're walking around like this. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> now, uh, there's certainly positives, and these are clear. Um, a woman who won the Nobel Prize uh, for a Peace Prize for uh, stopping landmines said, I couldn't have done it without email. Yes, that's it, right. It's a valuable organizing tool. What are the negatives of this? Well, the smart mobs are about groups who organize their activities in real time. Not every group who wants to cooperate has socially beneficial ends in mind. Uh -huh. So we, you've got terrorists, you've got criminals, you maybe even have spammers. <laughs> How, about the the mob? How about the mob? Is smart mobs uh, organized crime? Well, oh yes, they're, they, they are always on the cutting edge of technology. You know, organized crime all over the world is always ahead. It's like the, the military and the intelligence that organized crime is right there with yeah. them. They, they, the one use, one time only cell phone, things like that. They, they pioneered the stuff like that. Uh, how about hackers? Do we worry about that too? Uh, hackers may be the ones who invent the medium. Don't, don't forget, you know, Bill, Bill Gates was once a 19-year-old uh, Harvard dropout, and uh, it's the users who quite often create the uses for new technologies. Yeah. I remember my experience with the mob was a little scary because it was possible to do things as part of a mob that you would never do as an individual. Uh, you, lose, you lose a little bit of your self-individuation. Individua you see that with uh, digital smart mobs? Well, I think there are a lot of great opportunities for things like eBay to pop up on, on people walking down the street. But I also think, and that's why I used the term, that we're going to see demonstrations in the future that are not necessarily nonviolent or democratic. Yeah. Like any technology, it has benefits and also has pitfalls. Yeah. It's, you talk about digital cities. Tell me about yeah. that. Well, I increasingly, it's possible to associate information with places. So I'm new in town. How do I get to Fifth and Main? Or is there a good Chinese restaurant in this direction? Or uh, what do the people who have eaten in this restaurant say about the service in the last two hours? So we're seeing more and more cities experimenting with putting wireless information yeah. that's available anywhere. I use the Zagat guides on my uh, palm. Yes. And that's incredible. 
yes. you, no matter where you are, you say, well, I'm here. What, where, what's a good Chinese restaurant within a mile? And, and it's there. You're, you're, these things you couldn't do before. Or, or what about saying, I'm going to be in the airport for the next two hours. Who here is from my company or my hometown oh, wow. or knows my friends? Are we getting to that, where these things are kind of uh, somehow communicating online, their presence all the time? And well, you know, we think of them as telephones, but increasingly they're little internet terminals. Yeah. If you remember what a PC was like 10 years ago, they're going to be a lot more powerful, a right. lot less expensive, and not too long. We also talk in here about sentient machines, that they, in a way, are going to have their own per sentience. Well, we, we have sentience in the sense that they can sense the environment, not yeah. that, that they're not intelligent. Not they're thinking, right. But, you know, we have barcodes on things now that tell you information. If you have a barcode reader, right. increasingly those are going to be replaced by chips that are going to be able to sense the environment. So right. maybe you can point your telephone at a piece of meat in the supermarket and it will tell you that it sat in the sun for three hours, 500 miles away. Or, or, you know, a shirt will show you the factory wow. where it's manufactured. Or I could put my phone at your shoes and you could send me the pattern for how to do it. Exactly. <laughs> Howard Rheingold's new book. It's always great reading Howard's stuff. It gets the mind going in all sorts of new and interesting directions. The new book is called Smart Mobs, The Next Social Revolution. He's been on the forefront of the last couple. Uh, let's see what's ahead with Howard Rheingold. Rheingold.com is the website, R-H-E-I-N-G-O-L-D. And there's so much more you can find on uh, interesting on the imminent benefits and dangers of smart mob technology at our website, and that's the screensavers.com, plus a link to uh, buy Howard's book as well. And our own catalog to, of tomorrow, you contributed to that, too. Yes, I wrote nice forward to that. Yeah, yeah, it was really interesting. It's great to have you on, Howard. Thanks very much for Thank joining you. us once again. Still ahead, I'm going to show you how to make Explorer a little more reliable in today's boot camp. And coming up next, get all the news headlines with one click of the mouse right after this web tip from Megan. Highlight a word on the screensavers.com and right-click it. In Internet Explorer, you get the option to do a web search. IE will open a new window with the results of your search. Ladies and gentlemen, Megan Maroney with the download of the day. And thank you for joining me today. I'm so excited do my to be here. Mac proselytizing. I can take any chance I get. With you with this. Actually, this is Mac shareware proselytizing. This is freeware, actually. Freeware. Mm -hmm. Even better mm -hmm. than shareware. Now, you have probably your set of sites that you go to every day. First thing in the morning, before your coffee, before your coffee, after your coffee. Well, it depends on whether or not I can actually use the keyboard. Some <laughs> right. days yeah. before coffee is okay, <laughs> most days after coffee. Well, this program will let you, if you don't even have coffee, you, you don't even, it's just one click of the mouse. You don't even need coffee. <laughs> I can crawl to the computer and hit the space bar. Exactly. This is an RSS news reader. And RSS is, is the, it's a format on mm -hmm. the web. It's, I'll show you actually what an RSS page looks like. Um, I had one here. It's, uh, it's it's basically built with XML, uh -huh. which is a new web language. So it serves up pages and it, this can actually exactly. pull, the, was it pull them or look at them? If you have a page like this here, mm -hmm. we've got it right here, um, then webs, what news readers can go through here, grab this, uh -huh. and send it to you. And Very so nice. the program that I'm looking at is Net News Wirelight. I used to use Mac Reporter, which was shareware. Uh -huh. I paid the shareware fee and everything. I switched over to Jaguar, and I lost the registration information. Don't you hate that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was just too lazy to call, but Leo showed me this. It's totally free. And we can subscribe to CNET or Slashdot or the Register. And I actually, you can even subscribe to weblogs. I have my weblog here, so you can read all about what's been going on in my life here, or Leo's weblog also and cool. to do this you can just the, here are all the sites that you can so choose it, from if you click on that does it, one of these does the story come up or the web page exactly come up yes we can go to leo's blog Got reference it. right there and you can go to straight to the website by double clicking on here and then to subscribe you just need the rss link which is like as leo's it's mt slash index xml we both use movable type uh -huh. the weblog program and they have rss built in get it's your cool. up to the date reports yeah it's very cool and if you use windows then there's a program called Amphetadesk, which is similar to Amphetadesk. Sounds like they've been driving all night yes links exactly. at the screensavers yep ladies and gentlemen good stuff now don't go anywhere martin's going to show you a brand new way to surf at work without your boss knowing anything about it be afraid. And up next is Leo's boot camp. Leo's going to help Michelle with her haunted keyboard. You can find out what's wrong, but only if you stick around when the screen savers continues. <laughs> Ba, 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 
Welcome back to the Screen Savers. I'm Leo Laporte. Coming up uh, a little later on in the show, we're going to spend the entire you know, last half hour of the show, maybe a little more, talking about how your hard drive is connected to your computer. IDE from the beginning, the past, the present, and what's ahead for IDE. Coming up, Martin will help you search in ghost mode. That's good for work. And find out what Time Magazine thought of as the, some of the top inventions of 2002. But right now, it's time for Boot Camp. Basic training for your personal computer. Brought to you by Leo Laporte's 2003 Technology Almanac. I know it's time to start thinking about holiday gift buying, and this is a great gift for the geek in your life. There's the DVD edition. That's the one you're looking at, available in Barnes & Noble. There is a calendar edition with a 2003 calendar from uh, the folks at uh, Borders Books. And, of course, all of them also sell just the plain vanilla edition for a little less money. Every day, a little bit of history. Today, did you know today, you might be interested in this, Paul, the first lobotomy was performed on this day. In, uh, what, what, take a guess, what year do you think? Come on, Paul, you were there. Any idea, Paul? What year? <laughs> 19... He's not even watching the show. 1930, <laughs> he's not, he's not paying anything. He's not watching 1935. <laughs> but what's interesting, the physician who did it won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1949, 15 years later. Hmm. So there. <laughs> Maybe Paul's already had that procedure. Yeah. All right, let's take a long tip of the that. He just doesn't care. <laughs> huh? I'm sorry, I missed it. I know you missed it. It's okay, because it wasn't that good. So uh, let me show you a tip. One of the nice things about Windows XP and all modern operating systems now, Linux, uh, Mac OS X and Windows XP, Windows 2000, uh, and Windows NT, is the operating itself, system itself is kind of independent of the applications that are running in it. So if an application crashes, it rarely crashes the operating system. In almost all cases, you can keep operating. That wasn't the case with 98 and 95, but it is true about XP. And you can take advantage of that by, sometimes, by launching an application in a separate process. And I'll, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Have you ever had an Explorer window crash on you? Sometimes it does, where you open something in, an in one of these windows, and you just and it, the, the little, you know, the hourglass just keeps going and going. It's dead, right? So, if that happens, you'll lose everything, right? All the, ex the Explorer basically is crashed. Your operating system survives, but Explorer is crashed. It has to restart. It here, if you have a lot of memory, a lot of resources, and you don't mind using a little extra memory, a great tip for getting Explorer to be more reliable is to have each folder open in a separate process. So if one dies, the rest live on. Here's how you do it. Go to Tools, Folder Options, and uh, you're going to click View here, okay? And you're going to click the, the button that says Launch Folder Windows in separate pro each in a separate process. By clicking that, you're making your system more reliable because if a folder crashes, the rest stay alive. I have that problem a lot with folders with thumbnails and media files, that kind of thing, where Windows is trying to interpret it. Very handy. Click this box if you have enough memory. If you're, you know, you're at 128 megs, you might not want to turn it on. But leave it on if you, uh, if you do have enough memory, because it really can make a difference. Michelle on the line from Greenville, Michigan, with a boot camp question for us, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Leo. Hey, Martin. Hey, Martin. <laughs> Everybody's saying hi to Martin today. <laughs> hey, Martin. He's What's up, Michelle? Yeah. Oh, that's um, so sad. I have Windows XP. Yes. And I guess I held down the shift key too long. Yes. When I was typing, and this little window came up, so I shut it down, and then now every time I start my computer, it won't let me type the same letter twice. Right. I you have to wait a minute. You turned on sticky keys. Ah. It's an accessibility feature for people who have trouble typing. Maybe they're using a math stick or for whatever reason. It'll, it's, an, it's an accessibility feature. Very easy to turn it off. I've done that. I, you know, when I was writing the book, a lot of times I'd be typing along and I just, a brain lock would happen and I would just, with my finger on the shift key. And then about, yeah, about five seconds later it goes beep, and this thing turns on. You just clicked OK, right? Well, by saying OK, you turn it on. Easy to control. Just go to the control panel, accessibility options. OK, Michelle? OK. And you're going to look and you're going to see sticky keys is enabled here. You can turn that off. Filter keys might be turned on. <laughs> These are all keyboard behaviors designed for people who have trouble typing to, okay, to make it you. possible to do, uh, to do, for instance, multiple keys by pressing one key at a time, things like that. You're welcome, Michelle. I thank you so much for calling, and I appreciate it. 
That's boot camp. Megan's working on the Screensavers website, I know. Have you yet converted it to uh, RPC yet? You got our RSS syndicated um, feed going? I'm working on our RSS feed, All but right. uh, I was actually just reviewing with Paul what we were talking about. Did we you fill him in on the lobotomy? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> Woo! Um, I wanted to remind people that everything we talk about. Oh no, now he's going on. He's, he's starting, starting to, to talk about starting it. Starting to talk to himself yeah. again. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know. That's what happens when you have a lobotomy. That's what happened. You know what they did? They drilled two holes in the person. This is the first lobotomy. Drilled. You don't want to know. They drilled two holes in it, and then they injected pure alcohol to kill the frontal lobe, so there's no emotional response. Wow. At all. And that's he got the he got the stuff. Nobel me Medical Prize for that. That's Nobel Prize. Crazy. That is crazy. They don't do it anymore, thank goodness. Well, imagine the fascinating things you can learn, and it could all be yours. <laughs> in the book. <laughs> in the book or in our newsletter um, at thescreensavers.com, oh. which will, I'm sure, have links to buy your book. That's true. I bet they do. Yeah. No, the newsletters, and that's free. You that's should always, free. at yeah. the very least, subscribe. All our tips, all our calls, everything is going to be all in right, there. Cool. What's coming up? Ma that, what? No, yeah. Stay where you are, folks. <laughs> Still to come, the Francis Farmer's story. Paul's going to tell us all about that. Plus, see what inventions, he remembers her. See what inventions made Time Magazine's list, list of top inventions of 2002. And coming up next, Marty shows you, hi, Marty, how to surf your favorite, yeah, get a good close-up of that, how to surf your favorite sites at work without getting caught ghost browsing when the screensavers continue. <laughs> Let's check in with Martin Sargent. It's time for the side of the night. Nice move. You like that? Yeah. Nobody saw it. So a large part of my workday is spent surfing the web, looking for sites of the night that I think might titillate you. It's my vocation. <laughs> and even if I visit the most raunchy smut site that ever came out of Eastern Europe, I can tell HR I was there for research purposes, <laughs> trying to glean some insight into the human psyche in the digital age, not because I'm interested in when flaming whip meets ostrich. You probably don't have this luxury. For many of you, going to a site as innocuous as CNN.com while at work might get you a reprimand, and that's where the new stealth web browser, Ghostzilla, comes in. This is your favorite site, thescreensavers.com. This, however, is what you should be working on, your 2003 fiscal strategy for the all-gravy restaurant. Now, this is your favorite site while searching in ghost mode through the Ghostzilla browser. Notice. If your boss was looking at this, he wouldn't be able to tell, unless he was very close, that you weren't doing work. But all the content from the screensavers.com mm -hmm. is right there. If I want to see a picture, I just move the pointer over the picture. Now, let's say my boss comes up to me. All I have to do is move the mouse pointer, watch this very quickly, up to the top of the screen, oh. bam, it goes right back to where I was working. Very now, nice. if I want to bring the ghost browser back, I move the mouse pointer from the left to the right, back to the left, and it pops right back up. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? But don't go to porn sites at work because it's still going to be logged in the server, okay? Little word of advice for you. And by the way, Ghostzilla is in no way associated with Ghostface Killer. Okay. Keep sending your Site of the Night suggestions to Martin at techtv.com. We're going to have a link to Ghostzilla at the screensavers.com. And Michelle, you, me, chat room later. Leo? Learn from Martin's bitter experience. Don't, uh, <laughs> they do track it on the server. We're just getting started, folks. Our last half hour dedicated to IDE is just ahead. And after the break, we're going to see Time Magazine's picks for the top inventions of the year. Be Some really cool stuff. <laughs> but first, Megan has this little Windows tip for you. When you have the desktop toolbar in your taskbar, you can move it all the way over so it only says desktop. When you double click, it pops out. Double click again, and it goes away. It's getting to be that time of the year again. The frost is on the pumpkin, the leaves are falling from the trees. The time when you begin to look back over the accomplishments of the year and realize nothing. This week's issue of Time Magazine fortunately features things that were important, things that did happen that made a difference, the best inventions of 2002. And joining me now via satellite from New York City to show us five of their top choices, Time reporter Jothi Totem. Hello, Jothi, good to have you. Hi, how are you? I'm great, thanks for joining us. So Time Mag, how many, how many inventions did you pick? A lot. Uh, we, picked a, we picked a couple of dozen, actually. I, I just, uh, I have a few here today yeah. to talk about, though. So we, we, we kind of got the 
five of the ones that would be most interesting to our audience. What's the process that they went through to, uh, you guys went through to pick these? Well, there were so many this year to choose from. Um, we really wanted to pick uh, some inventions that had a great idea behind them, uh, in addition to being some really inventive uses of technology. Now, not everything is available now. These are things that have been invented but aren't maybe necessarily available in the stores yet, right? Exactly. A lot of them are prototypes, so right. you can't necessarily buy them. Don't get all excited and rush out. Let's start with right. a, a new car from GM, the Highwire. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Uh, well, this is really an interesting uh, thing because GM, which isn't necessarily known for being a revolutionary company, uh, sort of rebuilt uh, the idea of the car from the ground up. Um, uh, this car doesn't have a steering column. Um, wow. It, you know, it, it uses a sort of fly-by-wire technology that airplanes use, right. so everything's sort of done by electronics. Um, the other really interesting thing is that the chassis is sort of... Um, uh, interchangeable, so um, you could switch out from, say, a sports car to a minivan um, <laughs> using the same basic uh, guts of the car. You just pop off the top and put a new one on. I like that. Right, idea. in theory, anyway. In theory, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if that actually happens. I don't think people have room in their garages for three or four different auto bodies. That's right. <laughs> now let's go to a microphone called Sputnik. Kind of a strange yeah, that, name. Uh, yeah, that one I actually have here with me, so I okay. hope you can. Uh, See yeah, it? I'm going to point it to, right, it's right here. Um, oh, it looks like the Tech TV logo. What is yeah. that? Or a <laughs> giant jack? It's kind of funny looking. What I like about this is that... Hold um, it in front of you so we can see it better. Okay. Yeah, yeah there it? you go. A little, more, okay. little more in front of you. More in front of you. Okay. There we go. Now they got there it. There you go. Got it? All right. Oh, All right. it looks like a pacifier for a many-headed baby. Yeah, what? can you believe that this is a microphone? Why? Um, what is, yeah, what's the point of that? Well, what I think is so interesting about this is that it's the basic same technology as a, wi a wireless microphone, which is sitting right in here. Right. Uh, but this is like if you're at a meeting, um, you know, instead of having to like stand in line for a microphone or wait for someone to pass <laughs> around a microphone, it. you can just throw this thing. <laughs> We uh, need that. It. I could throw yeah, it at I mean, Marty. Yeah, why didn't anybody think of this before? <laughs> it's kind of like the talking stick. You throw them the microphone, they catch it, and then they can talk into it. That's Same a great idea. idea. Sputnik, that's by Design Continuum, and MIT had a little bit to do with that one, I understand. Right. Tricky, what's that? Am I saying that right, uh, or is it trike? Trike. Oh, trike, trike. okay. Yeah. T-R-I-K-K-E. Yeah, sort of like tricycle. Yeah. It's got three wheels like a tricycle does. Oh, okay. um, this is sort of a, a, a new and improved um, scooter. It's uh, made you know, with the same material that those uh, Razor scooters that were all the rage last year are made of. Yeah. So, uh, the material is great. It's really you know, light and flexible, but the design um, offers a lot more stability, and it breaks a lot better than uh, the scooter does. I like that. So, and you, and, you, and you motivate it by kind of weaving in and out like that? That actually... Yeah, exactly. You kind of have to learn how to use it, but it breaks a lot better. You get uh, more control once you learn how to use it. I like that. Now, is that going to be available now? Because I want to buy one of those for my kids for Christmas. That's cool. Uh, yeah, I think it's available the soon. Trike. You have to check. Yeah. Bluetooth was big. Mm -hmm. We talked a lot about Bluetooth. These are the, this is the new wireless technology, the short-range wireless technology. And you guys really like the wireless uh -huh. headphone for, uh, for well, is that for yeah, uh, cell phones? Yeah, I've got that here yeah. right in front of me as okay. well. Can you see that? Yeah. So there's your okay. cell phone. That's a Bluetooth-enabled right. cell phone. Uh, it's the cell phone, but what's really important is the, um, the, he the handset part of it, the headset, the wireless headset, which you put on your ear. That's what's kind of new about it. Yeah. Um, and I think this is a great idea. I mean, people have been uh, thinking about using Bluetooth technology to make your cell phone or, or different devices talk to each other, like, um, you know, two computers talking to each other or your phone and your toaster or right, whatever. Right, right. But, I mean, really, this is a great idea. That's the idea most practical use, isn't it? I mean, yeah, you can no get rid wires. of that silly wire between yeah. your ear and your phone that makes you look like a lunatic. <laughs> of course, on the other hand, now you don't even have to see the phone anymore and you really look like a lunatic because they can't see a phone. You're just talking into right. space. Right, that's right. I don't know exactly. if it's a, it's a big improvement. Finally, for the skiers, winners mm -hmm. here, Head has a new design, the IC300. Tell me about that. Yeah, this is a really interesting technology as well, which I have to say, uh, I'm not, I have mixed feelings about this because it kind of means that you can ski uh, with a little less skill, sort of. The ski is very smart, maybe smarter than some of the skiers. Um, <laughs> it's made of a, a special material and it has a computer chip in it so that it sort of detects the conditions of the snow as oh, you're wow. skiing. So the computer chip responds to the action of the material in the ski, and then it sort of stiffens or becomes 
less stiff depending on the material of the snow. Wow. So um, that sort of affects how you ski. So you have to do a little bit less thinking about how you're skiing. Smart skis, the IC300 from Head. Five of several dozen new inventions that Time Magazine honored as the biggest, most important, best inventions of 2002, coolest inventions of 2002. There's lots more in their special issue. Jothi, thanks so much for joining us. No problem, thank you. Time Magazine reporter Jothi Totem. You can get links to everything about Time Magazine's coolest inventions of 2002 at our website at thescreensavers.com. Coming up next is the Screensavers Last Half Hour, a special show devoted to all things IDE, uh, IDE 101, if you will. We'll show you how to properly install your drives, what's ahead for IDE, and take a look back in time at how IDE got started. That's all ahead after the break, the history of IDE, when the Screensavers continue. He looks like a dog, doesn't he? <laughs> Welcome back. No laugh. No, they just encourage him. Welcome back to the Screensavers. I'm Leo Laporte. And I'm Patrick Norton. Thank you for joining us this half hour. It's our last half hour devoted to everything you would want to know and a lot you may not want to know about IDE, the history. I can hear channel TVs clicking off all over. I'm place. telling you, you want to install a hard drive, Everybody. you want to install a CDR drive, this a DVD is good drive. stuff. This is good stuff. We're going to show you, and we're going to talk about what's coming next, what's replacing IDE. And how many of you, let's face it, know the difference between PIO1 and PIO4? And don't you want to? Let's check in with the folks over at Tech Live right now to find out what's coming up tonight. Erica Hill. I was going to try to lie and say I knew the difference, but frankly, you'd all know that I. Yeah, you know, I don't think anybody really cares, to be no? honest with you. No, but we are going to talk care, about some cool Leo, stuff. I care, Leo. I care. A trip down memory lane. A trip down memory lane. Yeah. Hey, okay. what's coming up on uh, Tech Live? Lots tonight? of good stuff coming up. This evening, this is something we've talked about a few times, and it's going to affect every one of you out there. You know, your email can and sometimes is monitored by your employer. Well, maybe you thought you could get around that by communicating via instant messenger. Uh -oh. My friends, the jig is mm, up. Boy. America Online, which you may or may not know, recently announced plans to sell surveillance software to businesses. Now, the software will let your employer eavesdrop it. on your conversations over AOL's instant messenger service. We're going to tell you everything you need to know coming up tonight on Tech Live. Plus, this is very cool. Oakley has come a pretty long way from making plain old wraparound sunglasses. They've now moved into a line of high-tech military optics and get this, basketball sneakers. Kind of wacky, you wouldn't think it. Very cool. They're also using the latest technology to do all this, of course. So from shades to shoes, we're going to take you behind the Oakley magic tonight on Tech Live. Very cool story. Neato. Who's whistling over there? Oh, uh, we're just whistling. Whistling. Many, Whistle while you work. Whistle while we work. That's what we do. <laughs> well, wait, wait, well, hold on, hold on. We can only do four notes. Yeah. Uh, Anything Disney's more than that. Lawyers call we got to cut a check. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Thanks, guys. That's what's coming up tonight on, on Tech Live. Live. Every once in a while, we get so excited about what we do, we decide to take a half hour of our precious time and devote it to one single subject. Mm -hmm. And today we thought, I know it sounds kind of weird and geeky, but frankly, hard drives are fascinating. The IDE yeah. interface, we're going to talk a little bit about integrated drive electronics or Not intelligent just hard drive drives. It's what connects your hard drives, your CD-ROM drives, your Nowadays, drives. it's a very important part of your internals of your computer. So first up, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of IDE, where this all came from. First of all, there is debate over what IDE stands for. Oh, I'm shocked. Integrated drive electronics or intelligent drive electronics. It means the same thing. In the early computers, to add a hard drive mm -hmm. to a computer, you'd put a card into the computer yes. and to connect the hard drive to the card. Or sometimes if you were really lucky, the hard drive would be attached to the card and uh, plug the entire thing, Excel hard cards. The plus cards, the hard cards. I still have two of those. Absolutely. Somewhere. Quantum made those. Mm -hmm. And actually, that was the inspiration for the IDE drive because Quantum realized, for first of all, putting it on a card on a motherboard is not a great thing. The vibration, the heat. It weighed about five pounds. It just doesn't <laughs> work very well. It's not ideal for a peripheral. But they realized, you know, what if we took all those electronics that is on the card itself and put them into the hard drive, integrated them, 
into the hard drive, right. then the card itself could be a simple little thing that goes in the ISIS slot that connects up to the hard drive. And that's how the IDE was born. Compaq was the first to make IDE drives, and that's where the name comes from, integrated or intelligent, because mm -hmm. all of the circuitry for controlling the drive, instead of as it, it being on the card as it used to be, is now built into the drive itself. But there's still circuitry or a card down on your motherboard. Yeah, the card is really a basic interface. Mm -hmm. The circuitry, the, the controller circuitry is all built into the motherboard chipset, and the and what it's basically doing is passing commands to this. What's great about that is it can offload the processor. Now that didn't happen right away in IDE. That was later. That's called bus mastering, and that happened later. It was something a part of SCSI for a long time. So is IDE is it is it the the stuff on the drive, the stuff on the motherboard, the cable, or all of it? It's all together? of the above. The IDE interface it requires mm -hmm. an intelligent drive. It requires an interface. Now they uh, after a while they said, well, we're going to move that interface card since everybody's going to need a hard mm -hmm. drive. We're going to move that interface uh, out of the card and actually build it into the chipset. So now all motherboards come with, and you can see on this is a pretty right. standard motherboard IDE connectors built onto the motherboard, and that's what you'll be connecting your hard drive to. Every IDE chain, and there's two on this motherboard as there are on most, can handle up to two two drives. Now, the original IDE was for hard drives only. In fact, you'll remember in the good old days, you had to actually uh, put drivers on and do some sort of weird interface for things like CD-ROM right. and tape drives. Uh, by the time they came up with uh, IDE, I, let me just see, I have a reference here. IDE, well, it was actually a TAPI. Okay, let me, let me go back in time. Right, TAPI well, allowed you to control That's when you start being able to put CD-ROMs. Right. Actually, before that, they came out with there, there was IDE, mm -hmm. and then there was ATA, mm -hmm. which is the same thing. It stands for AT adapter, because the IBM PC AT. Right. And ATA standard was first submitted in 1990, approved in 94. So that's what we're talking about mm -hmm. time frame-wise, about 10 years ago. The ATA-2 was introduced a few years later. That was the one, remember in the, this is a real bit of history. In the old days, you had to know how many cylinders your drive yeah. had, it how many tracks, and you, it, you had to put it in the BIOS before the BIOS could actually talk to your drive. Well, when they introduced ATA-2, that was when drives started saying, oh, I am this many cylinders. I know what I Automatically am. Automatically configured. And that was a huge boon. Yeah. At the same time as uh, they did that, drives also started to add LBA. Now, this is another common. I learned this from the Logical IDE Logical block fact. addressing? Yeah, I learned this from the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, IDE fact, which is some interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. I thought for a long time that the limitation of 502 megabytes per drive was an IDE limitation. It wasn't. Even the very earliest drives could address more than 100, mega, 100 gigabytes at a time. Uh -huh. It was a BIOS limitation. And they started modifying the BIOS so it could see larger drives, drives with more than 1,024 cylinders. And LBA, or large addressing, built into the ATA spec so that these larger drives could be addressed by these mm -hmm. new BIOSes. But it really wasn't a limitation of IDE. So ATA2 comes out. That means we can get bigger hard drives all of a sudden, hundreds of gigabytes, or 100 gigabytes. ATA3 introduced SMART, the system monitoring technology that nobody uses or cares about. Well, somebody somewhere. Somebody must. It. Security. <laughs> and uh, finally, ATAPI. That's where ATAPI right. ATAPI came in, and that was ATA packet interface. That allowed you to take the same IDE controller that's on the hard, that's on the motherboard and talk to things like a CD-ROM or a tape right. drive. You couldn't do that at first. You had to have special connectors and special drivers. In fact, most of these were SCSI, remember? Yeah, even were SCSI or they came bundled with a sound card. Remember the Creative Labs, the Sound Blaster? It was kind of a poor man's yeah. SCSI interface that talked to the uh, CD-ROM drive. Uh, in 1998, a TAPI 4 came out, and that merged the ATA3 spec and the ATAPI spec. So we now have one spec that covers all the hard drives, all the DVDs, CDs, the uh, tape drives. And then in 1998, Ultra DMA came out. We spent a lot of time on this show talking about how Help, silly that was. Help, Didn't make any difference. Ultra DMA 3366, now we're up to Ultra right. DMA 100. These are faster ways of accessing the drive, faster than the old programmed interface mode, the PIO mode. Right. But basically, the drives have gotten faster, and that's the most important thing. It's not the interface. The drives are yeah. still slower than any interface you've got connected yeah. to them. In theory, if the if the memory on the drive, the cache on the drive is packed out, it can actually take advantage of the ATA-100, the ATA-133, but right. it's for just a tiny percentage of the actual usage time of the drive. So we're now up to a TAPI 6. 6. And that gives us the hundred greater than 137 meg gigabytes on a drive. Is that ATA-133? It gives us ATA-133. Okay. That's the newest spec. Just came out, relatively recently came out. Okay. That's how all hard drives are connecting uh, right now. But there are some changes. When we went to the, the original, uh, just one more piece. This is the old 40-pin uh, cable that mm -hmm. came out with the original IDE drives. You know, all IDE even today is 16-bit. Yeah, and it's all parallel. So basically, parallel. 
multiple bits of data running at the same they time. They doubled the number of wires when UDMA 66 came out. Actually, they did it when 33 came out, but they right. required it when 66 came out. 80 wires. Uh, plus some error correction, some CRC that gave it some... Just to deal with electrical interference because there's just so That's much information That's what they claim. That's what they claim. Back and forth. Very fast data going fast. And now the newest thing, and you're going to talk about that in a little bit, so I'm not going to steal your thunder, but the new IDE Serial cables IDA. are going to look like this, and this is still IDE. It's an interface that has a lot of power and potential and future left in it. We're, not, we're far from exhausting what IDE can do, and in a little bit we're going to talk about where IDE is going. But the key on this is... The circuitry was built into the drive. That's why, for instance, your compact flash mm -hmm. can use an IDE interface. Even though it's flash memory, it's got that built-in circuitry. It's a standard interface. It's a standard way to access data of any kind. All right, we've, we've traveled back in time far <laughs> enough. We've got the history of IDE. For more on the terms and explanations, I've got three very good links. How Stuff Works really does a good job yeah. of explaining how drives work. I've got PC Guide's introduction to IDE, and then the IDE FAQ. It's a little out of date, unfortunately. It hasn't been Tom's kept up to date. has a really good one. Too. Also, very good one. We'll have to add that, because I, I forgot to put that in there. I gave it to Roman. Did you? Oh, good. That's You'll at the screensavers. You'll find the links up at screensavers.com. All right. And now, we've got to take a quick break. Well, you're going to do a wireless tip. A wireless tip. All right. But we'll be back with more IDE, don't forget. <laughs> more IDE. Oh, I recently got an email yet. from Dina who said, hey, if a large concentration of wireless networks, 802.11b, Wi-Fi, can they interfere with each other? Can we reach Wi-Fi saturation? I like that concept. 802.11b, Wi-Fi, if you pack too many wireless access points into too small an area, say an apartment building or a small neighborhood, if you don't configure them up properly, you can have big problems. Wi-Fi can run on 11 different channels in the 2.4 gigahertz range. Put two or more WAPs on the same channel next to each other, and you'll lower the throughput on both. Have a couple more in there or really max them out downloading all sorts of different stuff at the same time, you can actually almost shut down the networks. So you should put five channels between adjacent WAPs. Talk to the neighbors and make sure yours is set to channel four and the neighbors is ah. set to say channel 10. And that's just Wi-Fi. Because the 2.4 gigahertz frequency is open, lots and lots of devices use it, such as your microwave. Now, in theory, you shouldn't have too many problems. That said, don't put your WAP next to the microwave because your network will slow down every time you torch a, a box of popcorn. 2.4 gigahertz wireless phones should automatically hop to a different frequency if they sense interference, such as your downloads over the Wi-Fi network. But we know cases where 2.4 gigahertz phone systems have completely fouled up Wi-Fi networks. That doesn't mean your network is sunk. Try a different channel for your Wi-Fi, and try moving your wireless access point, your antennas, even the phone's base station around. And if all else fails, hey, you can move your network to 802.11a, which runs at a 5 gigahertz frequency, which will solve all your 2.4 gigahertz networking problems, at least until everybody in the neighborhood moves to 802.11a and crowds that spectrum, too. <laughs> oh, boy. We got a great link to nocat.net's FAQ on 802.11b, lots of other wireless tips on the website. And if you have a suggestion or tip, please send them to me at wirelesstips at techtv.com. I'm going to try that. At home. You should. Four or five plate channels between mm -hmm. uh, each adapters. of the WAPs. Very that good way idea. they don't interfere with each other. I would talk with one would be enough, but four Well, or it five. turns out if you put them next to they each other, there's a, few yeah. there's a few megahertz of overlap. overlap. Creates problems. Great stuff. Coming up next, we're going to continue our uh, last half hour of IDE. Patrick's going to show you how to get those IDE devices installed to achieve maximum performance. Do you put the CD-ROM on with a hard drive? Do you put it on separately? We'll find out when the screensavers continues. Look at that. A black guy. So because I'm the old guy, I did the history, but you're the young guy, so you do the installation as we continue with our IDE wrap-up. I thought it was because I was the only one who knew how to use a Phillips screwdriver. Uh, you are. They're complicated. They're and very complicated. I can use the minus drives, but now, you know, those plus ones are straight tough. slide. Installing mm -hmm. an IDE device is not as simple as just plugging it into any free spot on the IDE chain. What's an IDE chain? Well, you know, let me grab one of these. Mobo. Let's grab some demo devices. Leo, will you be my assistant here? Hi, Shelby. Okay, these are the IDE you know, slots, ports, whatever you want to call them, on your motherboard one there. One blue, that's the Ultra DMA, and then one regular, one black. Exactly. This is your basic IDE cable I have in your hands. Obviously, one end of the cable goes into the motherboard, and hopefully the other end is going to go to your hard drive or your CD-ROM drive. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Does it matter what end? It matters a great deal, and that's why, actually, if you can get close in here, you see how this is keyed in here? There's two things going in here. One, there's a a little spot right Missing. there, you can just barely see it, that's, that's plugged in there. And yep. two, there's, it's actually keyed you to can't, the slot itself. That you could not put in wrong. Makes it extremely difficult. If it doesn't fit, you're putting it you in backwards. You must quit. Oh, I'm sorry. 
something else. <laughs> Back to the Johnny Cochran. Second, you got the other end of the cable. You hopefully, if you're going to have to, if you're going to install a, an extra driver CD-ROM dive, you need two of these little plugs on here. If you only have one, which a lot of, of less expensive computers or kits come with, right. you're going to have to find an IDE cable that has both slots. Now, on the older 40-pin uh, wire cables like mm -hmm. these, it didn't matter which end was on which side, but on the new Ultra DMA cables, it does, because there's a twist in there. Mm -hmm. So you must, you, and they'll say in the instructions, because they're color-coded, right. you must put the right one into the motherboard and the other ones into the uh, drive. One can only hope. You can also get longer ones if you need. And that's one of the biggest problems, because once you get it, we'll, we'll show the inside of the case, right? As soon as you open up the inside of the case and you take a look at it, you'll notice a lot of times they'll be folded, or they'll do these 180-degree twists. They're too twists, long, yeah. Because a lot of cases, is if you don't stack up your drives properly, you, since you have to put these in one way up and one right. way down, you could end up having to do things like this or like right. this or running it over here. A little planning will help with that. A little planning will help. And you know what? If, if you're buying a, a ribbon cable, buy the longest ribbon cable you can afford. Just do it. Trust me on this one. <laughs> so we got that set. We're talking about the cable issues. Second of all, when you're adding a second hard drive, You've got to properly configure or an extra a second CD-ROM drive, DVD, CDR, CDRW, whatever it is. You've got a master and a slave, right? We showed you those I two. I got to turn off the Star Wars movie back here. George Lucas <laughs> is going to get upset with us here. Just keep talking. I did not know that was on. <laughs> so one of these is going to be the master and one of these is going to be the slave. Generally speaking, you put the master on the end and the slave on the next one in. So we're going to take a look at our hard drive here. We talk about configuring the jumper settings properly for a master-slave configuration. That's these little guys right here. Thank you. See that in there? Now, unfortunately, our, our Mac Store demo drive here doesn't have the jumper settings printed on the label. So now, most do, thank goodness. Most do, because well, actually, I, I you went never down. Remember, and I opened up on the PDF file, and out of the 140-page document, <laughs> there it is, which is a little long. We actually found is this what you want? a table of information like this, and you see how it says jumper oh, it style, is. master, slave, cable select. Cable select means whatever order they're in there, the cable will just take care of the master or the slave configuration. What you want here is the slave, which in this case, that blank space means you're going to pull the jumper out. So the bootable drive is the master. Yeah. The secondary drive is the slave. So in this case, these are the jumpers. These are, unless you have the little tiny four-year-old fingers, they can be really tough to get out. It's nice to have a pair of tweezers of some sort. And we're going to pull that completely out. And this is now configured for a slave setting. Almost always when you're installing an extra drive, you're putting in a slave. Oops, sorry about that. Let's slide over here a little All bit. Right. Here we have our sacrificial test bed. Now, these are not the prettiest cable layouts in here. You can say if Yoshi's, Yoshi's probably Yoshi's sitting somewhere saying that this is cringing. Grave. Can we get a good shot inside of that case? Let's even get that out of the way. <laughs> That's not a gently or nicely arrayed out cable system, so don't... It looks just like mine, though, i got to say, and probably most, most of our viewers. Most people at yeah. home, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to tip that down for a second. You notice something actually inside of here. There's two areas here. Right down here, we have a drive cage for three and a half inch drives, and then over above it, this is the drive cage for your five and a quarter inch drives. Three and a half inch drives are your hard drives and probably some sort of floppy drive, maybe a zip mm -hmm. drive. Zip drive, yeah. And a five and a quarter inch drives are your full size drive base. CD ROMs, things like that. Yeah, now one of the things you want to do, you know, some there's a bunch of different, there's like four different drive bays up here. If I was installing a CDRW like this one, you notice something. We talked about cable arrangements, it's really pesky. We see this right here. You see the red side, there's a red end of that cable. And you see that right there? It's called a Molex power connector. That's mm -hmm. your power connector. The red side of the cable always goes towards the power connector on a hard drive or on a CD-ROM drive. And you notice something? We set up this for a slave. We got the slave properly configured by pulling out the pin. And just for fun, we're going to slide that in there. And you notice something? The one that's the master, the DVD drive on the top, well, we're going to follow it up with the slave drive. And we're going to lay that in there so the cables are right next to each other and I don't have to do any crazy cable gymnastics. It's just a nice loop from one drive to the other. Last thing you're going to do before you fire that up, and by the way, don't do this with the system on like I was about to do. <laughs> I, I was going to say something, but I thought, he's a big boy. It's the excitement of live television, <laughs> He knows what he's doing. In fact, <laughs> unplug it just to be safe. Yeah, you should unplug it just so you don't electrocute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that was cute. <laughs> you'll pay for that, Rayvon. Get that in there. Same situation. Now, a lot of times, this is a drive cage. You'll see a screw in here. You can pull the drive cage out, or there'll be a lever. Almost always that easier to put those in case. when you remove those. Yeah, and you're going to slide in. Same process. You're going to put that slave drive in there in a place where the. Now, I'm going to ask you the easily. tough question. Tough question. We never have enough drive slots, cards, no, chains. It's very common to have a couple of now CD ROM, CD burner, maybe even a DVD, mm -hmm. and a hard drive. 
Can I mix the CD and the hard drive? Do not mix the CD and the hard drive on the same IDE. We talk about put them on things. separate cables. Exactly. There's basically there's two channels, two IDE channels. You use one for your hard drives, channel number one, which is going to be like your faster one. Channel number well, actually the same speed. But you use right. channel one for your hard drives. Use channel two for your CD, CDRW, DVD, ROM drives. And if there were enough chains, it's a good idea to have a burner on a separate chain from yeah. your your CD if you're ever copying CDs. And but it'll work that, without yeah, that. It should work without it. If it doesn't, you can. Try. You can pick up like a promise card that adds additional slots inside your system, additional IDE ports inside your system for less than $25. The reason is the IDE chain slows down to accommodate the slowest device in the chain. You exactly. put a CD on there, your hard drive is going to operate a little bit slower. You want a tutorial? We move a little quickly for you. We got stuff that'll teach you how to install all your IDE devices, all about IDEs, the name of the article. Everything you ever wanted to know! Up on the screensavers.com. Up next, finishing up our entire half hour of IDE. I'll tell you what the future holds for IDE. This is exciting. Well, at last, is it time for something better? Yes. Do so we need even more stuff to make the something better really work? Yes. And you know what? Make sure to keep watching Tech TV. Wow! <laughs> he can leap tall buildings in a single bound, ladies and gentlemen. At least Norton. short desks. IDE has been around for years. We talked about it. It's getting old. People say it's getting slow. I don't, I don't know think if so. I buy into that. You know, common misconception is that SCSI is faster than IDE. Actually, right. in tests, IDE is a little bit faster and also than SCSI. And SCSI drives depends. tend to be faster than IDE drives. Hold up that drive there. This is a fast drive, or an old drive. An old drive. Nonetheless, it's a hard drive. It's an IDE drive, the big old ribbon cable hanging off yep. Of there. Yep. A lot of people say, oh, well, ATA-133 is going to be faster because it's, it's got, it, yeah. It's burst mode, it's faster. In burst mode, it's faster. Look, imagine you've got a highway. Right? ATA 66 has three lanes, and ATA 100 has six lanes, and ATA 133 has 12 lanes. Well, if all you're driving down that highway is one 1966 Volkswagen Beetle, it, don't it doesn't matter how many it lanes don't you matter. got. <laughs> okay? And that's the problem is hard drives are considerably slower. They offer up considerably less throughput <coughs> than the actual the, the ATA, the specs, the offer them. Now, in what? theory, the burst mode is sometimes good because if you have like eight megabytes of cache memory, you can whack through everything in the cache really fast. But in most cases, you are nowhere near. Yeah, but think about it. Your eight megabytes. Eight megabytes. Right. That's less than a tenth of a second on 133 I know. megabyte. I know. But it's a beautiful tenth of a second. It's <laughs> awful fast. <laughs> Well, Nonetheless, we're getting rid of all these parallel cables. Everything's going serial. USB is serial. Mm -hmm. Firewire is serial. Firewire's proven that a serial connection can be very fast. I think SCSI's a serial connection. SCSI's too. a serial. Well, any. Nonetheless, what it's all going to is serial ATA. See this little tiny connector in my hand there? Isn't that nice? Let's hold up the ribbon connector I, next. I to like it. Because this is a serial ATA connector. Fewer, fewer cables. Yes, means and smaller more reliable. Cables. And you see how much smaller that is? It's going to block less air inside your case. Yeah, it's it's also running, too. instead of running like 5 volts like this does, or 3.3 volts, it's running something like 250 millivolts. They've gotten serial interfaces so fast now that you mm -hmm. don't need parallel. You don't need to send 16 bytes at exactly. a time down that thing. And that eliminates USB interference. USB 1394, exactly. USB 2.0. Exactly. So we're going to take a look at this. This is uh, Seagate was kind enough to loan us. Check this out, folks. This is a serial ATA drive. You aren't going to see many of these around. This is Avalanche. brand new stuff. You can't buy these in stores yet. So check this out. The serial ATA cable is going to plug on there. And uh, the really interesting one is the power cable because it's set up to use pretty much any type of power you can float in your system, like 3 volts, 5 volts, or 12 volts. This one is a, an adapter that came with our card. And where did that card go? It moved around again. Uh -huh. We actually have a serial ATA card. What's interesting is they're now selling not only serial ATA cards that will allow you to attach these drives to go under the table. There it is. Yeah. Uh, okay, serial I ATA got cards I'll out there. Right. But they're also doing serial ATA motherboards. As a matter of fact, I believe Kevin Rose has one that has it on there, and you can see the serial ATA cable. I just bought a new one. The new uh, ports right down Intel there. Intel chipset, the 845PE, has yeah. support for ATA. And this is a pretty out of control motherboard because not only does it have IDE and a RAID, which is in there, IDE, RAID, and serial ATA. So yep. there's motherboards out there that pretty much have everything on the planet. Mine does. Mine yeah. Does. Interesting stuff about serial ATA 150 megabytes per second up from 133. Backwards compatible with your existing ATA if you use an adapter for the cable, right? Good ideas so far. Is it going to make a performance difference? No. Remember what we told you about having a big highway and the single Volkswagen bug? None of the hard drives out here are going to saturate that bandwidth. Even if they do, right now, these are connecting over, in most cases, the PCI bus. Until they integrate them into the chipset, guess what? You right. go from your 150 megabit per, or megabyte per second 
serial ATA to 133 megabyte per second PCI. This is a, a SIG card that is an add-on card for, it allows you to add right. serial ATA. Now, on the other hand, uh, there may be less electrical interference, so you might sure. have a little bit more reliable There's a lot connection. Of just, just the airflow, the connections, the ease of use, it's right. going to replace. It's going to be easier for manufacturers to put in there as soon as they reduce the cost of the drives and they start producing the drives in volume. It's cool stuff. Thing is, we're going to have to wait for stuff like PCI-X, mm -hmm. which is, offers more throughput on the mm -hmm. PCI bus, or hypertransport, hypertransport right. would be another one. It's going to be interesting to see if it's going to be like PCI-X on you know, Intel and hypertransport and AMD, but a bigger front side bus, a bigger main system bus to really take advantage of these. This, in theory, can go 150 megabytes a second right. sustained throughput. 150. No this, drive can do that. The second and third generation are going to be 300 megabytes per second and 600 megabytes per second, wow. which means you can do really neat stuff with RAID. If you can get it all to work, if you can get faster hard drives. It's the future. It's not here yet. Yeah. But that's where IDE well, is going. What's funny is serial ATA, the adapters and the motherboards on shelves now, hard drives I coming know. soon. I bought one, but I'm ready. You're ready. I'm ready. He's when they ready. come out, I'll be ready. If you haven't had enough IDE, do us a favor. Check out our Uber IDE article at thescreensavers.com. And coming up, you know what? We'll read your emails when the Screensavers continues. Final word. Final word. Come see the show in person. If you're going to be in the San Francisco Bay Area and you'd like to join the Screensavers live on the set, go to www.techtv.com slash ticket line for information and to request tickets. Go there so we can see you here. Be sure to catch tomorrow's show. You'll see how digital matte painting comes to life. Yeah, on film with Craig Barron and learn the art of icon design. We got a 16 year old graphics whiz kid who is doing beautiful icons. I'll show you how you can do the same. And then we'll show you how to live spam free using the built in spam filters in OS 10. Is a that hot a promise? topic right now. You promise me? Spam free. Never. Nah. No, but it's very interesting what OS 10 is doing. In fact, Entourage is doing it, Microsoft's mm -hmm. doing it now in Outlook as well on the Windows side. There's some really interesting built in spam filters that are using new techniques we'll talk about to fight spam. It's More possible. Filtering. Yeah, it's uh, they're using all sorts of interesting styles and techniques. Yeah, it's good stuff. Questions? I have a question for Yoshi. Yoshi, are you there? I'm here. All right. This is from uh, Butler, Pennsylvania. Uh, Apache user writes. Okay. <laughs> that can't be his name. Oh, Optics, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any way to make a switch to connect a switch to connect the number of hard drives? He says we used to have a device you could hook up drives to then switch between them. Uh, back in the old days, Leo should remember. Thank you. <laughs> I know there are uh, in, insertable drives that would switch among, but he wants to switch, like, you know, like a printer switcher, switch between hard drives. Can you do that? Not that I know of. That um, sounds dangerous to me. It sounds real dangerous. I think you'd mess up your hardware, really. Yeah. One thing I can possibly think of is maybe with the machine off, you could switch the power and have multiple drives on the same chain, but... You could make a physical switch, but you you've make got to power I down I'd, to do I'd it. use the hot swap drive base. Those work great. Yeah. yeah. Pop them in and out. Computer just can be on. Oh, you can. You can do a hot swap. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's hot great. Hot swap. Okay. Just hot make sure swap. you get one that actually supports hot swapping. All right. <laughs> yes. Run it under yes. Windows XP. That's it for the screensavers. I'm Patrick Noir. And I'm Leo Laporte. But thanks for joining us. We got to thank our guests too, Howard Rheingold. And thanks to you for joining us. Take care. We'll see you later. Bye bye.